to deal with our structural <coughs> budget deficit problems. So um, the dollar remains the only true global currency. There are, are a variety of reasons why this is unlikely to continue, which I've now given you. There will have to be alternatives if the world is to um, enjoy an adequate global supply of global liquidity. The question is, what alternatives? So that brings me to uh, the even less happy case uh, of the euro. So I sent a book off to the publisher about two years ago now, um, which was about the dollar, its exorbitant privilege uh, as the world's only true global currency, and the alternatives. And I said, uh, one alternative going forward will be the euro. So I have a little bit of writer's remorse in that I was too optimistic about the euro, but who in, in, in their wildest dreams could have imagined the level of incompetence we've seen from European policymakers over the, the intervening two years? Not even me. Um, and that has had an impact on the international use uh, of the euro. The European Central Bank has been writing these reports for 10 years now, annually, about one of the great marks of the euro's success has been its growing international use. A new report came out a, a couple of weeks ago. The uh, international use is not continuing to grow. People, central banks, private investors are moving away from uh, the euro. It will not surprise you given, given recent events. So what is Europe to do? Um, everybody knows what Europe has to do, and increasingly we believe that it will not do it, which is uh, kind of a <coughs> dire prognosis. Um, Europe needs to do only three things to solve its crisis, recapitalize its banks because it has a banking crisis, get growth going again because it has a very deep recession, and deal with its debt overhang because in the current state of affairs, um, a number of European governments, a num number of European sovereigns are insolvent. They're not going to be able to pay back what they borrowed. So those are the three problems, and, and we know from the experience of other countries at different points in time, Brazil has had banking crises, growth crises, and debt crises, as have other countries. There's plenty of history to draw on to figure out how to, how to address these issues. Let me skip forward a couple of slides. Um, what we're seeing in Europe at the moment is big worries about the stability of, of European banks. So the figure I show you here is how the, the change in household and corporate deposits in the Greek banking system. And you can see all the bars are, are negative. Greeks have been withdrawing money from the Greek banks as fast as they can, and the only surprise is that as fast as they can hasn't been faster. There are some technical problems for the retail depositor, the small depositor, to get his money out of the country. Uh, the saddest story I heard was that because of language problems, uh, a large number of working class Greeks were moving their deposits to Cyprus, which was not where, where you would want to deposit <laughs> your money. Um, but, you know, Greece sadly is what we say in the, call in the U.S. toast. Um, the, the Greek story is over. Greece will exit the euro. Greece will default again on its debt. The Greek banking system is insolvent and will have to be fully recapitalized. Many people will not get their money back. The, all that is known, has been known for a while, but Greece is only 2% of Europe. Spain is more like 14% of the euro area, and the situation now seems to be exactly the same in Spain. So there was more disturbing uh, information today about how the bank walk or bank jog is turning into a bank run in Spain, which might bring things to a head more quickly. Um, so if you agree on this diagnosis, um, Europe has to complete three important tasks. Task number one is bank recapitalization. It has to restore confidence in the banks. I think bank recapitalization is probably the uh, single most important thing Europe can do in the short run. It will be a visible signal. It can be done in a week with the proper political 
will, it will require much more than the 100 billion euros that was recently committed in principle, if not in practice, to recapitalizing the, the Spanish banks. And it will work only if these are, are loans by the European Stability Mechanism, the Rescue Fund, capital injections, equity injections directly into the banks, not loans to the Spanish government, which then are on lent to the banks, strengthening the banks while weakening the government. That's not going to solve the problem. Um, we thought that Europeans had recognized this issue and had finally decided to address it on June 29th. They had another summit. It lasted till four in the morning. Again, they emerged from the summit and they announced that they were going to create a banking union that would basically have two elements, a common European supervisor and authorization for the European stability mechanism to inject funds directly into the banks. Hallelujah, everybody said. Uh, and, and they've been backtracking ever since. So this is Hans Werner Sinn, the, the German economist who has been leading the backtracking. Um, the Germans are worried that you need um, protections that the European stability mechanism won't lose any money when it, when it takes equity in the banks. You need a common supervisor to be sure that these problems will not be allowed to arise in the banking systems of small southern European countries again and you can't have direct capital injections until that common supervisor is in place. The problem is, I think I had this on the earlier slide, there's supposed to be a proposal for a common supervisor by September. There's supposed to be agreement in principle on, on the common supervisor by December. You could imagine they might be able to staff it up under the best scenario next year and the bank run seems to be occurring now. So there's what we call technically in economics a time consistency problem here. The Germans are putting the, definitely putting the cart before the horse. Uh, the markets are not waiting. So I don't know how that one is going to play out. Uh, I think uh, opinion really has been polarized in, in Germany there has been a, a harsh negative reaction against banking union in the rest of Europe. It's seen as increasingly Im, Im, important. Um, task number two, getting growth going uh, again. Here, uh, I write all economists with a grain of common sense, which doesn't mean all economists agree on what should be done. Northern European countries that can, whose governments can spend more should spend more to support demand. Southern European countries that have to consolidate should consolidate tomorrow rather than today. They should try to backload some of their fiscal consolidation. If they make really credible commitments to consolidate tomorrow, they can get away with spending more today. Meanwhile, the European Central Bank needs to do to more to support growth. A weaker euro exchange rate, which the ECB could engineer, would be part of that story and uh, grants in aid rather than more debt, rather than piling more debt on existing debt is the only way to keep Greece in the Eurozone. I conclude reluctantly that uh, antagonism between the Greeks and the Germans has reached such heights now that all common sense on this issue is out the window. The Marshall Plan that Greece needs and that I think it deserves given that uh, the Greeks didn't create their problems by themselves. The German banks, which lent them all that money, helped them. Um, they're not going to get the, uh, the, the Marshall Plan that would keep them in the Euro. Um, in the interest of time, I will go on and talk about task number three, which is dealing with uh, the unsustainable debts of not only Greece, but potentially Italy, uh, Spain, Portugal uh, and, and Ireland. So what do you do about these countries uh, whose interest rates are much higher than their growth rates and whose debt to GDP ratios either are now or, or very soon will be above 100 percent? 
everybody in, in this room who recalls their Brazilian history knows that if your debt to GDP ratio is above 100 percent and the interest rate you pay on the debt is above the growth rate, that's not a sustainable situation. That's the situation in which European countries uh, find themselves. Here I think they have three options, what is called debt neutralization, make the debt of the, European, of the Eurozone or the European Union and not the debt of Italy. If they did that, European Eurozone debt to GDP ratios would be lower than US debt to GDP ratios, but that's political poison in Germany. Um, option number two is to bring that nominal growth rate up relative to the interest rate. The ECB could intervene in the secondary market for bonds and, and um, push down the interest rate. It could bring inflation up a little bit if you believe that there's su such a thing as a modest increase, central bank engineered increase in the inflation rate. And that would effectively uh, uh, inflate away a portion of the debt. And op but that's political poison in Germany. And option number three is to restructure these debts, uh, which unfortunately is also political poison in, in, in Germany because it has rather negative implications for, um, for the German solvency of the German banks among others. So this is what we call in English a Hobson's choice where none of, the, none of the choices are appealing, none of the choices are possible. Um, what do you do? My own assessment is that you need um, a, a, a comprehensive agreement by the politicians to do the debt mutualization and that's impossible. You need a comprehensive agreement among the politicians to do the debt restructuring and that's impossible but you need a decision by a few central bankers to change ECB monetary policy. And while I'm not convinced that's likely, I think it, it is at least conceivable um, that such a thing might happen. So that leads to this conclusion that the only scenario under which the euro survives is where the ECB uh, changes its stripes, where it engages in the European equivalent of quantitative easing, which enables it to buy bonds of sovereigns on the secondary market, where it can lend to the rescue fund, the ESM, which can turn around and recapitalize banks and buy bonds on the primary market. <coughs> when Greece exits the Eurozone, the ECB can provide un unlimited amounts of liquidity to the banks and the financial system. Fon Foaming the runway is what you do when the plane is about to, to crash. Will any of these, this happen? There has to be German agreement to something in order for anything to occur in the Euro area. And I can imagine a scenario in which uh, the four, three important uh, Southern European politicians form a united front. They talk sense to Mrs. Merkel and she talks sense to the ECB. Am I saying this is likely? No, but it's a, a scenario. The problem, of course, being that the rhetoric within Europe has be, been becoming more antagonistic rather than less. It's hard to see how um, calm minds could prevail. Um, we, we can come back to the Greek exit and the like. Let me skip over some of those things. There are, there are a bunch of issues that I haven't talked about like euro bonds and uh, fiscal union and political union. I, I think we have learned that you can't have a monetary union without a banking union. You can't have a banking union without a fiscal union. You can't have a fiscal union without a political union. And I think European leaders always understood that, but they thought they had 30 years rather than three years to get there. In 2008, they were sideswiped by the global crisis, so they only have three years to get there. But I think the fiscal union and, and the political union are, have to be on the back burner. There are much more immediate problems for Europe to face. So that's a, a, a pretty 